day right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Well, hello there. It's six o'clock. I'm Michelle Jubri, and this is Jubes and Co, the show where we'll get into some of the things that have got you talking today. Now, if you are a regular viewer to this show, you will know if there's one thing I dislike right now, it is the ridiculous, pathetic obsession with Partygate. However, one thing I dislike even more is double standards. So, never mind the sole obsession with the Tories. What's been going on within the Labour Party at that time? I'll be looking at that. And by the way, you might think that going, all that goes on in politics means we could do with a bit of reform in our political system. Yes. And to that mind, the elections bill passed the House of Lords last night. It brings with it some serious change. But have you heard about it? If not, you're not alone. It brings in things like photo ID for voting, and it'll see the Electoral Commission take a step away from true independence, according to many. Are these positive moves for UK democracy? And the cost of living, as we know, it's going through the roof. There's loads of talk for what the government should do to help. But hang on a minute, what about businesses? Now, I'm a capitalist and I love profit making, but hold on just a second. Don't you think that right now in these strange times, companies should be shouldering more of the burden too? And Justice Secretary Dominic Raab is talking tough when it comes to prisons, starting with the language we use. Cells have been called rooms, people in them called clients. You what? Well, Raab wants to stop that and I say, hear, hear. Prisons should be places of punishment first and rehabilitation second. Am I wrong? We'll have all that to come, but first, the latest news headlines. Michelle, thank you. The top stories at six o'clock. The first British national named as Scott Sibley has been killed in Ukraine, while a second is still missing. It's understood Scott Sibley was a military veteran. A Foreign Office spokesperson confirmed both families are currently being supported and the Foreign Office is urgently seeking further information. More on that, of course, as it comes to us. In other news today, the Prime Minister has said the behaviour of an MP caught watching pornography on his phone in the House of Commons is unacceptable in any workplace. It follows the Labour leader calling for the Conservative Party to take action now against the MP. Boris Johnson says the case would need to go through the appropriate complaints procedure as his chief whip launches an investigation. I think it's obviously unacceptable for anybody to be uh, doing that kind of thing in the workplace. It would be the same for any kind of uh, job up and down the, the country. I mean, let's, let's be absolutely clear about that. Uh, what needs to happen now is that the, the proper procedures need to uh, be gone through. Uh, the independent uh, complaints and uh, grievances procedure uh, needs to be activated and uh, we need to get to uh, understand the facts. A heroin addict mother has been jailed for 20 years for the gross negligence and manslaughter of her seven-year-old son. Hakeem Hussein, who was asthmatic, died after Laura Heath used his inhalers to smoke crack cocaine. She admitted child cruelty. The little boy's body was found in a garden in Birmingham in 2017, where he died alone after suffering an asthma attack. The Conservative MP Jamie Wallace has been charged with failing to stop after a car crash in November last year. South Wales police say he's also been charged with failing to report a collision, driving without due care and attention and leaving a vehicle in a dangerous position. 
Wallace recently came out as trans and revealed in a personal statement he'd been raped and blackmailed. The MP is due to appear before magistrates court in Cardiff next month. Agency workers hired by P&O Ferries to replace sacked staff don't know how to use life-saving equipment. That's according to the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency. It's found 23 failures on the Spirit of Britain, including a lack of familiarity with emergency equipment, such as life jackets and flares. It also found rescue boats weren't being properly maintained. The Spirit of Britain was detained following an inspection just over two weeks ago before being cleared to sail. Downing Street Chief of Staff Steve Barclay has been meeting with managers at the passport office today to avert a growing crisis over processing delays. A senior government source says Boris Johnson could privatise the passport office amid fears that families will miss out on their summer holidays. Analysis from the agency shows the number of passports being printed is only reaching the lowest number in five years. Our reporter Rosie Wright spoke to a woman who's been trying to renew her daughter's passport before she flies to America to study. Come here today to basically beg if they can do anything. There is nothing they can do, even if somebody has died in the family. I've been explained, it's been explained to me it's a one to two week process to be able to fast track them. There is no give, no humanity in the system at all. Bulgaria is confident it can replace its entire Russian gas supply after the Russian company Gazprom cut the country off. Supplies to Bulgaria and Poland were halted after the countries refused to pay in the Russian currency rubles. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky described the move as blackmail. Gazprom is continuing to supply gas to Europe via Ukraine. The government says post-Brexit import controls on European Union goods won't be imposed this year to try to ease the cost of living crisis. Traders are expected to save at least £1 billion with the new approach. The government's going to publish a new plan for next year. And that comes as Boris Johnson met with the Swiss president, Ignacio Cassis, today to work on a new trade deal. They met in Downing Street. And the Queen has hosted a face-to-face -face meeting with the Swiss president. Posing with Mr Cassis and his wife Paula, she was photographed without her walking stick. The monarch has returned to Windsor Castle after spending last week at her estate in Sandringham in Norfolk. Scientists have discovered the optimal amount of sleep per night for those in middle to older age is now seven hours. Cambridge University examined nearly 500,000 adults aged between 38 and 73. Researchers also found that those sleeping for longer or shorter amounts reported more symptoms of anxiety and depression. On TV, online and on your radio via DAB+, you're with GB News. Now it's time for Michelle and Deeps & Co. Thanks for that, Polly. Well, keeping me company until 7 o'clock tonight, here's my panel. We've got former MEP and the CEO of First Property, Ben Habib, the director of Future Cities, Austin Williams, and journalist and political consultant, Emma Burnell. Uh, you know the drill on Jubes & Co as well, don't you? It's not just about us and our thoughts here. No, it is not. It is about you at home as well. What's on your mind tonight? What do you think of the stories that we're going to be discussing? What have I missed? What are you talking about at home right now? and we're not talking about here. Uh, also, by the way, who do you ever want to see on the panels? Uh, do you like the look of these guys? Do you want to see different people? No offence, I'm sure you lot are brilliant. But if you're sitting at home thinking, I really want to hear from whoever, get in touch. Tell me, what do you think tonight? GBviews at gbnews.uk is the email. Or you can tweet me at Michelle Jubes or at gbnews. Don't forget, if you've not already, you can subscribe to us on YouTube. You can download our app. You can watch us back uh, all over social media. You can listen to us uh, on a podcast, what else? Oh yes, you can even take us uh, with you in your car, we're on the radio. So wherever you are tonight, you are very, very welcome. Now, if you watch this show regularly, you will know what I think of Partygate. If you don't, here's a clue. I don't think much of it at all. I'm completely bored about obsessing about it. However, 
One thing I also dislike is double standards. And while everyone in the Labour Party has been obsessively focusing on Boris and cakes and a load of nonsense, quite frankly, I wonder what has been going on over at the Labour Party. Well, people are starting to talk now about Sakia and his beer. Uh, Defence Secretary Ben Wallace thinks that there should now be a police investigation into Sakia broke lockdown rules. It's been trending all over social media as hashtag Durham Partygate. Emma, what's going on? What do you think? I think uh, Ben Wallace wants to be the leader of Conservative Party. Um, that's not unusual. What's uh, that got to do with Keir Starmer drinking beer? I think that the reason Ben Wallace is trying to make this a story is because he wants to be showing that he's out front and really good at attacking the Labour Party. I think Ben Wallace is not very good at politics um, because clearly the one thing that actually, if you're Boris Johnson, you want and you also want Michelle for different reasons, is for people to stop talking about Partygate, not go on to think of a new thing they can talk about. Is Did Keir Starmer break the rules? According to the police, no. Do you think and, the police investigated properly? And that is the classic properly? difference. The difference is, there are two big differences. One, this has been investigated and he hasn't been fined. Do you That's think it was investigated properly? I'm not sat in Durham Police Station, but I'm not going to um, dispute that they you have investigated it to the best of my knowledge. Well, look, I'm not Miss Marple, but, but look at that also... screen. There they are. There they are. Look at them on the screen. If you're listening to the radio and not watching... Well, they're certainly the... standing more than two metres apart by the look they're of it. They're drinking beer, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I don't gentlemen. think beer was legal. I bloody hope not. I was drinking a fair <laughs> amount of it during lockdown. But the second and really important thing is the Tories should not be taking the public for idiots. The reason Partygate is a scandal is not because the Prime Minister had some cake. It's not because the Prime Minister had some bubbly. It's because the Prime Minister broke the rules he set himself. Ah. And that's why it matters. Keir Starmer didn't set these rules. No, but he certainly voted to enforce them on the rest of us. And ben he Habib. clearly thinks he stuck to them, and so the police agree. Keir Starmer wanted stricter lockdown rules. But I think the interesting thing here is I see no upside for the Conservative Party out of this investigation. Exactly. I mean, there's going to be a binary outcome. Either Keir Starmer is going to be found to be innocent, in which case it puts the spotlight straight back on Boris Johnson, or Keir Starmer is going to be found to have broken lockdown rules, in which case Keir Starmer will resign. And that will will put, he? I think he will. After all the, all the table thumping he's been doing in the Commons, he will have to resign. And that, again, puts the spotlight straight back on Boris Johnson. There is no upside out of Keir Starmer being hauled up in front of magistrate's court or being issued a fixed uh, penalty notice as a result of breaching lockdown rules. I think Richard Holden is going to really regret bringing, bringing forward this investigation. Uh, Austin, what do you think? Well, <clears throat> um, I don't think there's any upside for anybody in this conversation. I, to be honest with you, this is the kind of conversation that I was opposed to uh, like the discussion about a police state that we, we had, some of us had, uh, during lockdown, that the idea that nobody was allowed to drink lager without a scotch egg, you know, all these kind of stupid rules that we've sometimes forgotten about, and now we're just kind of pillorying the, the leaders of, the, of, of various parties for not complying with those rules which none of us actually wanted to comply with at all ourselves. So I just think we're going to be sucked down a rabbit hole, which I don't really want to go down. I'm not sure this is fully cutting through the public, because I actually think by keeping on with this story, it just shows how kind of petty-minded, you know, cake or beer, which would you prefer? Uh, and actually, people remember the fact that under the Coronavirus Act, they were, you know, uh, they were locked down. They are now out of lockdown. They are suffering energy bills, uh, cost of living crises and all the rest of it. And suddenly we're still having this conversation because this is not a conversation which is engaging the public. It's not meant to. This is an internal Westminster conversation about, you know, about um, promotions and for leadership of various parties or it's about getting one over on, on the opposite. Well, it's not just the uh, public that's bored of it. It's me as well. I found it completely boring, but uh, I'll tell you what I don't like. I do not like um, uh, hypocrites. I don't like double standards. I don't like people's personal suffering uh, being le leveraged for political gain. So as I've always consistently said, I couldn't care less, quite frankly, if Boris Johnson had a slice of cake, two slices of cake, one beer or ten. Uh, a lot of people broke the socialising rules uh, during this period, as we've just been alluding to, but I do not like double 
global standards. Um, let me know what you think on that. Do you even care? Nigel says, Michelle, oh dear, oh dear, you simply do not get it. Johnson was the rule maker. It's an integrity thing. Nigel, I do get it. And yes, I also know that Johnson was responsible for making the rules. But Keir Starmer, my friend, he was the one that them to be applied to the rest of us and if he had his way as Ben alluded to we'd probably all still be locked down now anyway let me know your thoughts uh, when I think about all the goings on uh, in politics at the moment right now you might have seen some of the uh, toing and froing again today this person uh, been in trouble for not stopping at the scene of a crime this person uh, in trouble for bullying and harassment this person for porn could be for thinking that what we really need right now is to pick the whole thing up throw it up in the air shake it all about and have some serious reform well, if you're in that camp, you might be happy then that the elections bill has been making its way through Parliament. Got to ask, though, did you know much about this? Because not many people seem to have. Uh, last night, it finally passed the laws, which basically means it's going to become law as soon as it gets royal assent. Uh, in this bill were things like mandatory voter ID. So you can't just rock up uh, at the voting station now and say that you are who you make out you are. No, you've got to have some form of ID. And there's also uh, some changes that... Some some people are saying basically mean that the Electoral Commission uh, is no longer as independent as it ought to be. Ben Habib, your thoughts on some of these things? Well, I think the Electoral Commission is anything other than an independent regulatory body. Um, you know, you'll remember, Michelle, from your Brexit party days, you know, in the short space of nine months, we fought two general elections. And actually, the Electoral Commission breathed down our neck like no other... Uh, entity could possibly have done so. You know, it was actually stifling democracy. It was looking at everything we were doing down to the minutest detail. And actually, our finances were tickety-boo. They were absolutely clean. And even though they made our lives incredibly difficult, they found nothing. And yet they allow the two major parties to get away with all sorts of peculiar donations from Russians and uh, you know, in the case of um, in the case of the Labour Party, you know, momentum of effectively flooding the Labour Party with its with its membership and therefore controlling the agenda. Now, the the Electoral Commission, which is one of Tony Blair's bequests to the British nation, the Electoral Commission is just another quango regulatory body which allows the two main parties, the Labour Party and the Conservative Party, to effectively. Uh, ping pong between themselves, trying to stuff it full of their own cronies like they do all the other institutions that govern us, and trying to sway the debate in their favour. The Electoral Commission does not protect democracy. It stands in the way of democracy. And actually, what we ought to do is not reform it. We ought to ditch the Electoral Commission and simply rely on the fact that it's illegal for parties to take finances from dodgy people and to take finances in particular ways that, are, uh, that, that can be statutorily barred. You don't need a commission with appointees... To oversee the whole thing. To oversee the whole Austin? thing. Austin? Well, I'm, I'm with Ben on this. I, I mean, it's, it, it sounds a bit like our own internal EU uh, technocracy uh, determining what, how elections are, are judged and financed and all the rest of it. Peter Bourne MP said that they were politically corrupt, totally biased and morally bankrupt, and I, I think I go along with that. Ultimately, as you, as you say, it's set up by Tony Blair with the Supreme Court, all, all those kind of regulatory reforms that went on uh, 20 years ago or so, um, and the idea that this is an independent organisation which doesn't have any political members or political party members belonging to them, that doesn't stop them being Stonewall diversity champions, for example, completely in hock to uh, what Stonewall uh, dictates. Uh, it doesn't stop them actually having their own particular views where one of the commissioners said that he regretted the result of the Brexit uh, uh, vote. So they have a very kind of interesting kind of bias. Uh, and uh, your very own, GB News' very own Darren Grimes, uh, prosecuted mm. uh, by, by them and then found <laughs> that he hadn't done anything wrong. So I think that there's something scurrilous about the entire organisation. The idea that, you know, it's, it's heralded as some, you know, some idea of democratic uh, organisation by the left is beyond me. I really don't understand that. Given the fact it's set up by Tony Blair, there ought to be a clue. Hello? <laughs> Do we need it? Let's start at that point. We need some sort of oversight. Whether it's this electoral commission or a reformed electoral commission, there needs to be independent oversight of elections. What we absolutely do not need is the government taking that oversight role. That's insane. I'm sorry, that would be insane if it was a Labour government, it would be insane if it was a Brexit party government, it would be insane if it was a, as it is a Conservative government. You cannot be your own watchdog. You just can't. 
that's the sort of thing that we would monumentally chastise but any Ella, other why, why do we for? need a body overseeing <laughs> We need something electoral... to overseeing. Why? I mean, we pass laws. We have loads of laws for which there are no independent bodies mm -hmm. required for oversight. The police enforce the laws. They arrest people who break them. And, and the judiciary then decide whether or not the police have made a valid... Valid arrest. Well, I'm aware you... that we're going to come on to the multiple problems yeah. of the judiciary and the fact that they've already got more than enough to do that they're not getting on with. So, frankly, I think having a body that is actually outside of the far more important um, role of actually chasing proper criminals and actually regulating how we run elections separately and differently and from a different budget is quite important. But more than, more than anything else, I don't want to gloss over the fact that what has happened is that this government has taken a power grab and said, we're just going to look over ourselves. And if we mark our own homework as winning, that's fine. But you can but only have a power grab if you have the institution of the Electoral Commission in the first place. If you abolish it, neither the Labour Party nor the Conservatives can make a play for the Electoral Commission. But they I, I also think they, I also think they, lost, the, they, yeah. they lost the vote because the Labour Party left the, the uh, Parliament uh, before the main vote yeah. got, took place and therefore they were outnumbered uh, because they went home. Uh, yeah, so just to be clear, you make a really good point um, because if Labour is so bothered about this and they could have turned up and voted against it. So this was passed, 202 votes to 181 and just to put some context in that, just 67 Labour peers turned out to vote against the measure. So they can't be that I mean, That's one thing that abolishes the House of Lords because I think it's a, an anachronism. But having said that, I mean, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a Labour peer. If, I, if it had been down to me, I'd have been down there kicking, up, um, kicking people and making sure they were getting in, in the lobbies and doing their job. Yeah, but there is also, hang on, there is, I would also abolish the House of Lords and one of the reasons I would do that is because it's undemocratic. So you can't have it both ways and suggest that maybe they should have turned up and then voted against this. This is down to Parliament, it's down to government and, and their own actions. And the fact well, that I they've set up this... I can have it both ways that I disagree autocratic. with the democratic vote. That's my democratic right. Well, let's talk uh, Verto ID because this is another part of this bill that's just uh, been passed yesterday. Are you in favour of it, Austin? Should you have to, you know, use no, photographs? No, I'm not. I'm, I'm not in favour of it. It's a, it's a tricky one, I have to say, because um, I think that there is something amiss in some elections that have been demonstrated over the last you know, 10, 15 years or so. There's something um, fraudulent have, has occurred in a number of constituencies and something ought to be done about that. Now, um, I, I'm, I'm opposed to ID per se. Uh, whether it was the COVID vaccine ID or, or whatever it might be. But I do think that if the um, parliamentary decision had gone down the route of suggesting that you might have to have some form of identification, at the very least, not necessarily take your passport, which is something which is quite police state about it, but, you know, maybe your, your, your bills or something that demonstrates that you actually live in that particular area, then I think that's fairly legitimate. But this is a wide, you know, it's a much wider conversation about, you know, uh, people voting who live abroad, people who, uh, you know, there's, there's something uh, needs to be reassessed in the way that we vote. Uh, it's, that's not down for the Electoral Commission to determine, by the way, but well, it is something we need to consider. I, I agree. We've got to look at it. I mean, postal votes, I think, is what you're alluding to, Austin. You know, the postal voting system is utterly abused, particularly by the Labour Party, I'm afraid to say. It very, absolutely very knows. It absolutely knows every household's uh, uh, aged people. It gets to them early. It tries to get... Uh, uh, relations to fill in the ballots for them. You know, the Brexit Party, again, I, 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 I just speak from, you know, bitter experience. In Peterborough, the Labour Party were up to all sorts of trickery and the Electoral Commission were nowhere to be seen to hold them to, to, to rights. And one of the reasons, and I'm not going to do a party political broadcast for Richard Tice, but one of the reasons Richard has changed the name of the Brexit Party to the Reform Party is the thing that we all came away, and I'm not a member of the, uh, of the Reform Party, but, by the way, but what we, as members of the Brexit Party, came away uh, with was that this country is in dire need of political reform. House of Lords, uh, terms for MPs. We've got to break... We've got to find a way to break this two-party system, which effectively results in either the Conservatives or Labour Party governing us and pumping their own cronies either into the House of Lords, the Electoral Commission or wherever. We've got to find a way of giving, giving new parties an opportunity to be heard and to establish themselves. And at the moment, our systems are set up to squash any new entrant. It is the ultimate in in Goliath holding David at bay. So we definitely need reform. Emma, what do you reckon about uh, voter ID, yes or no? 
Voter ID, I think, is probably the dog that didn't bark. Um, there's a lot of worry about making it harder to vote, but I think actually what will happen is that people will do an educational programme and people will just learn to vote with their ID. Um, I'm not... I, I roughly sit ideologically where Austin is. I, I'm not in favour of us carrying ID in general, but I think some of the worries about it are overplayed. I also agree uh, with Ben that we need massive political reform mm. to allow new voices to be heard. Whether what are you the talking about? On the left or the right, they are shut out far too often. Are you on about proportional representation? Or oh, what? God, I get so bored of, a, of, of conversations about PR. <laughs> but when you um, say I that mean, you need you this think change, boring. what? But then <laughs> I what think change? I mean, that, that is a part of it, how we vote, how the votes are distributed, how we make sure that people um, feel that they are better represented Presented. There are abolishment of the House of Lords, voting at 16. All sorts of things could and should be looked at. I would set up a, a commission, a, one, not, a, not a commission of the great and good, but one of these sort of people's commissions, the way they did in Ireland to change their various systems. Um, I think that's one of the best ways that we could do it. Put it into the hands of a really diverse group of people, a group of people who agree with each other on almost nothing else, and have them have to come together and decide the way that we should govern ourselves in future. The worrying thing about these people of parliament uh, uh, exercises is that they very often uh, have uh, trainers who go in there to educate people in the way that they, <laughs> maybe, they, the maybe they should think of the right <laughs> outcome. So I think we have to be a little bit cautious about uh, this. Yeah. I, mean, well, I don't think people are that stupid. I think that they're not stupid at all, right? People are very, very intelligent. However, it doesn't mean to say that they're not taken to a room and they're educated in the ways of whether it's climate conversations or whether it's diversity training or whatever it might be. There, there's a, you know, there's a one-trick pony which is going around politics today, which I think yeah. we ought to be very careful about. And so to suggest that you know we we're not in, in a framework where we can freely disagree happily, I'm afraid we're getting much more constrained in what we're allowed to say and what we're not. But allowed isn't to isn't the point of having a big room of people who disagree? that they wouldn't have to come together and, and agree on any issue other than the one they've been asked to look at. So it's not, about, like it's not about their diversity training or their issue... Or politics their doesn't work like that. You can't have a single issue political conversation without actually maybe broadening it out, whether that's on a geopolitical level today, which is phenomenal, whether it's on an environmental conversation or a cost of living. All of these things impact on the way that we that's consider... That's how Parliament various works. Issues. It's not how these constitutional no, I know. committees that's what I'm work. Saying constitutional problem with them. committees yeah. actually do look at single issues and they do them really well. Well, are you in favour of those? Let me know. Uh, Mary says, I totally agree with Mr Habib. Uh, the Electoral Commission does not work for the people. Mer says, the electoral changes will take away my right to vote. He says, I'm disabled and cannot drive or go abroad. I therefore have no driving licence or passport. I have no, uh, no ID, photo ID. I've been scuppered. He says, uh, democracy don't make me laugh. What I would say back to that is, as I understand it, they will provide uh, new changes, actually, to make it easier uh, for disabled disabled people to vote in terms of spacing, if you're in a wheelchair, for example, and also if you don't have a passport, driving licence, whatever, I think that you'll be able to apply for a free uh, photograph ID card, so that would help you in that instance, I guess. I personally am all in favour of photo ID to vote because, you know, if I ordered a pack of tights from Amazon, I had to go pick them up from the uh, post office, I'd need my photo ID for that. So why then would I be able to potentially impact the future of the entire country by just telling some random with a clipboard that I am who I say I am. Anyway, let me know your thoughts. Email gbviews at gbnews.uk. You can tweet me at Michelle Jubes or at gbnews. Tell me what you think. I'm uh, going to take a quick break. When we come back, I want to talk to you about the cost of living. Specifically, never mind the government, what do you think businesses should be doing to help you? We've got some ideas about that, and I'm sure a couple of people on this panel will disagree. I'll see you in a couple of minutes. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes & Co. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes & Co. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4pm until 6pm as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. 
It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there, welcome back to Jubes & Co with me, Michelle Jubry. A quick reminder as to who it is that's keeping me company on the show tonight. Former MEP and the CEO of First Property, Ben Habib. We've got the director of Future Cities, Austin Williams, and journalist and political consultant, Emma Bernal. Uh, lots of you, by the way, emailing in saying, stop talking about Partygate, Michelle, I'm bored. Listen, you don't have to tell me. I couldn't care less about Partygate. You will know if you watch this often. I don't even talk about it. However, I raise it tonight because I don't like double standards, but worry not. Uh, that'll be the last you hear about it for a little while until there is a significant development. Anyway, let's talk, shall we, about the cost of living crisis. I know that affects pretty much all of us now, doesn't it? Um, you know, people are saying things like they can't afford to even keep their pets because things are getting out of control. And I worry, I have to say, that things are going to get a whole lot worse. So what can be done about it? People always look to the government, don't they? You know, the government should do more, it should do this, it should do that. It's not doing enough. Government, meanwhile, are talking about things like potentially changing childcare, uh, talking about tinkering around with MOTs, looking at uh, food tariffs and things like that, which is all well and good, by the way, but I'm not somebody who likes to just focus constantly on the government. They should do this, they should do this. I like the government, quite frankly, to be involved as, with as little as possible. So I start then thinking about business. And I am a capitalist, I don't mind a bit of profit. Uh, that is indeed the purpose of a business. But these are exceptional times, aren't they? They're not your everyday kind of trading period. So do you think that businesses should be doing more? Uh, I've got to start, I think, with uh, you, Ben Habib, because I personally think nothing against profit making, I celebrate it actually, but people are really struggling and we've not seen anything yet. You know, we're going to see more impact from the sanctions in Ukraine and the war in Ukraine and a whole host of other things going to make it so much harder for people off gem rises, up in October. Should businesses be sitting there looking at themselves and saying, do you know what? We'll take a hit to our profits for, I don't know, six months to try and help our customer base. Well, it's a very interesting point you make. And... One of the great advantages of living in a free market economic world is that actually businesses have to respond to the, ne to the changing welfare of their client base, their consumers, and they have to adjust their prices to make sure that they themselves stay in business. So this is a generalisation that I'm about to make, and I don't want to be shot down because there are, the, there are specific e exemptions to it, but generally businesses will respond to straightened times by cutting prices, um, by making it easier for their customer base to buy their product. That is not universally true, of course. There are some businesses that make money out of misery. Oh, Ben, I'm and astonished that you said what you just said with a straight face because right. okay. I'm on your side of the fence and right. I, I'm in the camp of business. But the fact that you say that there's some businesses that you know might kind of take advantage, but on the whole, most of them will kind of act sensibly, I think it's completely the opposite way around. I would say that actually right now, most businesses, you know, lots of them have had hard times through COVID. They're seizing the opportunity to raise their prices. They're masquerading under this class out of nonsense. Oh, it's inflation, it's RPI, it's this, it's that. I don't doubt that those things are having an impact, but the price increases that we're seeing, often, more often
often than not, they're far outweighing yeah, those but, factors. You know, remember, businesses are not protected by the price cap on fuels. Business, some businesses have seen their cost base go up two or three hundred percent as a result of the increase in oil and gas prices. Whereas consumers, even though they've suffered terribly, have had the benefit of price caps in place protecting them. I mean, the real issue here, Michelle, and I'm sorry to come back to it, but the real issue here is that governments uh, experimented with the biggest economic... Uh, the, the governments embarked on the biggest economic experiment in, experiment in history, which was the lockdown of the country, the lockdown of the Western trading world by and large. And that is, that's what resulted in a breakdown in supply chains. That what, that's what resulted in the, in, in, in the massive inflation we've not, we're now experiencing. And it is really down to government to sort it out. Actually, I don't think the problem is going to persist for as long as people say it's going to persist. And the reason I say that is because we haven't got the massive increase in interest rates that most of these other inflationary spikes typically come with. And we're not going to see massive increases in interest rates because we've got very loose monetary policy and we're hooked what on What do you it. call a massive interest rate, though? Well, a we're massive... certainly going to see rate Well, go rises. back. I, I, I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to guess your age. But when I left university, you know, we had interest rates of between 10 and 15 per cent. Oh, yeah, we won't read and, that. And that's what I call a really significant... So when you see interest rates go from 7 per cent to 15 per cent, which was not an unusual move in, a, in, in straightened inflationary times in the past, we will see inter interest rates go from maybe, you know, half a per cent up to one and a half, two per cent. It's going to be much, much more muted. And the other, the other point I want to make is that the fuel-induced impact on the economy and inflation that is going to pass relatively quickly. We're going to wean ourselves off Russian gas and oil, with the exception perhaps of Germany, fairly quickly. We're going to... The, the, uh, uh, the OPEC countries are already pumping more oil and gas. We're already looking for other avenues uh, for resources. So I think by the middle of next year, actually, we should see the worst of this behind us. And I think it would be a mistake to actually be taxing or instituting taxes on businesses, if that's the suggestion of how businesses might pay more. I think to, to use this as an opportunity to tax business more into the medium and long term, I think would be a mistake because actually businesses themselves are still suffering from the ill effects of lockdown. The private sector is still suffering. And remember, the private sector has just been hit by an increase in national insurance on employer, you know, employers' national insurance. And the private sectors are going to be hit again with increases, increases in corporation tax rates. All at a time Can when the in? Treasury... Yes, you may. Sorry, I just God, God, uh, 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 Is reaching a crescendo, I can tell. Uh, all right, all right, I ruined the, the Treasury's punchline. got a record tax take. The Treasury's got a record. I'll stop there. There you go. There you go. Austin. <laughs> uh, I've got nothing to say. I just wanted to stop him. Oh, no, uh, I, I think... No, I, I'm, well, there's two things to this, isn't there? One is that, you know, you've mentioned at the very end the war in the Ukraine and the impact that that's going to have uh, on recessionary forces uh, in, in Europe. And you can see what's going to happen with Germany. It's already going to happen with Bulgaria and Poland by uh, stopping their oil. But in terms of the developing world, or what used to be called the developing world, may now be called the non-developing world, the impact is going to be devastating, not just in terms of grain being sent from Ukraine to, mm. to third world countries, but, and that's going to stop, uh, th through to their ability to kind of gain, gain oil and actually develop, because oil is an essential uh, factor. We, we're not going to be discussing uh, just stop oil, um, but actually we re realise in this day and age that actually oil is such a fundamental part of our, of our development. So I think that, you know, I, I, personally, I go, I'm more pessimistic than you've been. I think that we've, we're just seeing the start of something which is going to be really, really devastating for the economy, for our living standards, for the um, peace and stability uh, within Europe. We've already seen uh, Liz Truss, another one going for leadership, uh, d talking about a 10-year war. Where, I don't know where she got that from, but the idea that, you know, there, this is going to be a long, protracted uh, war of attrition with Russia fighting back and stopping oil. Uh, whatever we might have visions of wind turbines in our gardens, the fact is we rely on this material uh, to, to, to have a dynamic economy. And I think that's fundamentally where we need to go because... What we haven't had on the agenda for the last 5, 10, 15 years is a productive economy. There's been very much a savings economy, maybe making some benefits down the back of a sofa by kind of saving money left, right and centre. But ultimately, to invest in new industry, in new technology, in new ideas, that seems to have been off the agenda, even under the Tory party. So I think that's where we want to be, really be uh, encouraging our thoughts, rather than just kind of backing off and trying to have windfall taxes here, here there and everywhere. See, Emma, what I want to see a little bit more of is... Uh, 
Asda, Morrison, some of these supermarkets now have essentially started a price war. So you've had uh, Morrison's coming out, for example, and saying, you know, we're going to slash prices on this or we're going to hold price on that. Then that's kind of almost had a domino effect. You've seen all the supermarkets saying, guess what? We're going to reduce this. We're going to reduce that. And I think good more of that because you guys are still making a fortune I don't begrudge you that good good That's luck on you. free market economics. I know it is but what I'm saying is I'm a believer in responsible capitalism not irresponsible capitalism don't batter people when they really are having a hard time Emma. Yeah I mean I couldn't agree more I think um, I think the difference quite often um, when you talk about responsible or irresponsible capitalism is actually short term versus long term uh, mm. effects. Um, I think that there has been far too much short-termism in capitalism and in business for a long time. And that's partly been because of the way that we have set up in terms of, of business being legally obliged to maximise shareholder profit uh, year on year rather than having much better longer-term interest. And I think the supermarkets that engender customer loyalty by looking after the people when they're in need will actually be the ones who come out of this five, ten years down the line much stronger. I think consumers are really starting to understand the power that they have. And I think actually when we are making choices and when we have so many choices we can make because we're buying things online so much more now, I think actually we are going to reward those businesses that behave well. Yeah, in terms of loyalty, you mean customer? Yeah, loyalty. in terms of our loyalty, and in terms of you know, I'll buy from you. I won't buy from you. Mm. Because we're all looking for a deal. Because inflation is going up, and we're all being screwed. I just, I don't see the upsides in this. I mean, you can celebrate business, uh, nice businesses versus. You know, hard-headed businesses, I don't, I, I don't mind. I mean, there's no such thing as Pleasant, a nice business. Pleasantly I mean, exploitative are, or, not, or not so bad exploitative. But I think businesses are immoral. Is, is, can be <laughs> no, a long they're term. not. Yeah, businesses yeah. are amoral. They are... They oh, are... amoral. I thought you said immoral. No, amoral. Oh, right. Amoral. Yeah. <laughs> they, you know, they, they, they're not good businesses or bad businesses. Some are run well, some are run badly. But, by the way, there is something new going through business called the Environmental Social Governance Standards, which v most businesses adopting, my own companies adopted it, and that, that, that obliges businesses to have an eye on the environment, their social impact, and, and, and as well as the way they're governed. So there is, there is things businesses are doing anyway. And there is a, I thought this, I was just checking my thought process, the B Lab, the B uh, Corporation, you can get certified now that you're a good business under one of these schemes, and I'm sure that there's uh, lots of others, where they talk about the impacts for good that a business is having, not just It won't uh, surprise profit. you, though, Michelle, that a lot of what's defined as good, you might also define as woke. It mm. won't surprise you to know that businesses are being infected by woke as well. And I think ESG is an admirable thing to be adopting, but a lot of people are using it as an excuse to, to advance their own personal political agendas through business. And that is bad. Yeah, of course. I mean, yeah. don't even get me started on that topic. That's a whole different one. Uh, coming up at 7 o'clock, by the way, Nigel Farage, live, live from Medway. I think he joins me now. Nigel? Good evening, Michelle. Yep, yeah, I'm here in Medway. It's another Farage at large. I've got a live audience in the room. Some of them even look quite friendly, which is good. <laughs> and we're going to be talking about politics in this county of Kent because they may be nearly all Conservative seats now, but a few years ago, half of them were Labour. How are the Conservatives getting on here in Kent? We'll be joined by the leader of Medway Council. And it's the southeast of England, and you assume, well, of course, they're all rich in the southeast, but actually in Medway, there are some real problems with poverty and boy the cost of living crisis is really beginning to hit large numbers of people and I'll be joined on Talking Pints by two proper local celebrities they've done Big Brother they've done The Jungle they've done Dancing on Ice and for a decade both James and Ola Jordan did Strictly Come Dancing they'll join me for Talking Pints hope it's going to be a great evening Sounds good. Well, that's coming up at seven. Uh, thanks for that, Nigel. See you then. Uh, by the way, I've got the short straw, haven't I? Look at my background. Did you see Nigel's? I'm sure I could spy some pork scratchings uh, and a, a few pints. I need to have a word with the powers that be, I reckon. Anyway, I'm going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be talking about uh, Dominic Raab. He's apparently going to be cracking down on work language used in prisons. What's that all about? We'll have that after the break.
Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything, from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Coming up on The Mark Stein Show. Speaking out for abuse survivors in Rotherham, Sammy Woodhouse questions why a convicted sex offender was appointed to an advisor role on child exploitation, an MP she had to deal with. The great David Starkey will be on hand to discuss the constraints we all face when it comes to core liberties. Plus, Leilani Dowding will help name and shame the elite at Twitter, who now appear to be backtracking on their plan to silence free speech. All that and more on The Mark Stein Show from 8 o'clock. Hello there, I'm Michelle Jubre. A quick reminder as to who's keeping me company tonight. We've got the former MEP and the CEO of First Property, Ben Habib, the director of Future Cities, Austin Williams, and journalist and political consultant, Emma Burnell. Now, uh, when it comes to prisoners, what do you think? Uh, should they be called clients or residents? Uh, should jail cells be referred to as rooms? Dominic uh, Raab is convinced that such, I quote, wishy-washy terms are denting public confidence in our justice system. The deputy PM has issued a new style guide to all prison governors in England and Wales to crack down on so-called work language. Uh, what do we think to this panel? By the way, they did make me chuckle in the uh, break because Austin said, uh, he was asking me what I was saying. He thought I was talking about clamping down on work. I'm not talking about clamping down on work. I'm talking about clamping down on work. <laughs> Two very different words. Same thing. Work, work, can't blame the accent. Uh, what do you think to this? Style guides, work language? Well, I mean, the fact it's called a style guide says, you know, it's, it's, it's as work as it gets for me, I'm afraid. Um, but it is this idea that um, in order to make people feel comfortable or more, more to the point, uh, prison officers feel comfortable about uh, their charges, that they're calling them... Uh, residents or something rather than prisoners. I mean, I work in academia. I mean, we've been calling students customers for the last 20 years, apparently. Okay. So, and it actually diminishes and demeans the very relationship that we're trying to build up, one of trust and respect, uh, as well as one of recognising deference and the fact that I know more than my students. <laughs> so there has to be a certain level of detachment in this conversation rather than this kind of um, uh, clamour for engagement. But I do think that there's this, there's a difference between what they're trying to do with this, with this uh, conversation to normalise uh, uh, the relationship of uh, prisoners within within their rooms rather than cells 
rather than humanising. And I do think that there is a lot more to be done with the kind of some of the barbaric treatment that's been uh, handed out to, to prisoners. The treatment of prisoners under COVID is, is, a, is a chapter which will have to be written in the future because it was terrible. Um, but I do think that there are certain things, you know, whenever I see people going into prisons uh, with theatre groups or educational groups, or uh, I've been in several prisons with the debating matters uh, group, debating matters behind bars, to give it a plug, uh, you know, and you find out that there's prisoners that just rise to the challenge because they are real, sentient, sensible, intelligent people. Many of them, many of them aren't, obviously. But, and I do think that, you know, to draw out that humanity and to give them a little bit of hope, it, there's nothing wrong with that. But this is just some kind of uh, gloss on the, on the surface. Emma? I mean, if Dominic Raab thinks the reason that we're losing patience and trust in the justice system is a few people calling a cell a room, rather than the fact that we have record weights for what ends up as very low conviction rates, record weights for low conviction rates for rapists, then he's on cloud cuckoo land. All he's trying to do is move the conversation from the difficult looking at how we should change the justice system. And I couldn't agree more with Austin that we need to look at how we treat prisoners so that they don't re-offend. People who are treated with humanity, as Austin says, given a chance inside to change their lives are much less likely to be re-offending criminals and isn't ultimately what we want, less crime. We want a justice system that produces less crime. So let's actually look at what matters. Let's look at making the courts actually work. Let's look at what making prisons actually work. And let's stop messing around with stupid style guys to try and distract people from what a bad job Dominic Robb's doing. Well, a very quick question for you before I bring uh, Ben in. Do you think the primary purpose of prison is punishment or rehabilitation? Both. It's absolutely... No, the primary one. I, I, honestly, I think I, I'd find it really hard not to say 50-50 because if you just make it about punishment, then you are going to end up with a really, really high rear fiction rate. If you just make it about um, rehabilitation, then you don't make it a, a deterrent, which it should be. Mm. See, I don't struggle with that at all. I think, to me, prison, the, the primary reason that you are in prison is to be punished for the crime that you have done. Rehabilitation and all this nice stuff and all the rest of it, that comes secondary to me. Am I wrong, Ben Habib? Well, I, I, think, you're, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think prosecution and conviction uh, are key components. C confidence that people will be prosecuted and then convicted are key components of making sure the judicial system works. And I think Emma is also completely right in the sense that, you know, if you have a system where you've got incredibly low conviction rates, there's something either very wrong with the uh, arrests that are being made or the intervening judicial processes. And I suspect we're wrong at every level. And it's not just Dominic Raab, it's Sadiq Khan in London. You know, let's not forget the detrimental effect Sadiq Khan has had on London. And it's because... He's taken a very tolerant approach to crime, which is why you're so right, Michelle. We should be intolerant of crime. We should be tough on crime and we should be tough on the causes of crime <laughs> and we should <laughs> ensure... But why that... do you laugh at that? Yeah. He says no, you've got to It's a Blair phrase. Blair it's a Blair phrase. Blair phrase, <laughs> you know, which I, you know, kind of... I had my own eyes rolling in my head when I used <laughs> the phrase. But, I mean, he was right about that. You know, we've got to be tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime. It's got to be a deterrent. But also, Emma is right. When these people are released back into society, we want people to be less likely to re-offend. You know, that's the key component of it all. So, um... Yeah. But in many ways, the revocation of freedom, the fact that you're being locked up, that's the punishment, mm. yes? The fact is, you know, you could then lock them up for 23 and a half hours a day and say it's even worse punishment. But ultimately, I think while you're there, there could be things that you might do that would rehabilitate you back into polite society when you come out. There are some people, fair enough, who are unsalvageable. I understand that, right? There may be Islamist gangs who have no interest in doing this and maybe uh, are, are playing, playing every reef for fools. But I think generally we should, we should see people in the best possible light and I think there's something uh, something to be learned from this ironically one of the one of the language style guides that hasn't come out in this Dominic Raab report is uh, trans women uh, in, in 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 women's prisons uh, which is something apparently is not uh, not to be talked about um, I just, and they've got I just, its I own style that in. guide and there are uh, its own style guide for that kind of conundrum I'm, I would suspect I'm sure there's a there's a dress code for that yes. I'm sure that there is but um no I just think that you know, it, it, prison should be 
somewhere where it's so unenjoyable oh, that I you would do agree. everything Absolutely. possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. You, you yeah. would do everything possible to it. never yeah. end up back there ever again in your life. And the fact is, I mean, we talk about rehabilitation, sorry, reoffending rates and stuff like that. Well, it's not that much of a deterrent then. Because if you're happy, to, if you've just gone through a, a long stretch, you get yourself back out, and then you're very, very quickly back behind bars again, I it know, didn't but, deter you enough. But you know why the prison rates have fallen in the last two years? Because of COVID lockdown. So, you know, maybe we could lock down society and, and <laughs> create our own little individual prisons, and then maybe we'd have win-win. But I, I just think that there's something about liberty and something about denial of liberty which is fundamental. And most people don't want to lose their liberty which yeah. is why we have the ID well, class conversation as it happens. Well, then behave and you won't well, end up in but, prison. But they do. The vast majority do. That's the good thing, isn't it? Mm. It should be a very tough experience. It should be an experience they shouldn't wish to repeat, but it should also be an experience from which they can learn and get back into society and be contributing members of society rather than disruptors. You're such and a isn't there player. a space between it being very tough and them not losing their humanity completely? And isn't that the space that we need to yeah. find? Yeah, a bit like a 19th century boarding school. Yeah, but hang on. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't know. <laughs> but, but, some of, but, I mean, some of these criminals, I mean, I've got to say, some of these criminals, they couldn't care one jot about humanity, uh, uh, about the people who they are offending against. So, yeah, I don't know, if they're robbing or murdering or whatever it is that they're doing, the point they don't care about humanity. Yeah. yeah, but hang on, then the second that they get in prison, all of a sudden... Human rights and humanity is right up there, agenda number one. No, it it's wash our the agenda. We make them live by our rules, and that includes having decent rules for how they live. But you're not doing a very good job of making them live by your rules, or else they wouldn't be breaking the law and murdering people and doing whatever it is that's got them in prison in the first place. Well, absolutely. Let's change lots of things in society. As a part of that, hopefully we will then end up with a much smaller prison population that we can then treat with humanity. I think mm. crime will always be with us, as someone once said. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, I think that you're right on that one. Anyway, what do you think? Um, you know, I've, I have very strong views, by the way, because when I was a teenager, my then boyfriend was in and out of prison more often than a year-year, so I spent every other weekend in prison, uh, and he loved it, and half, half of his friends was in there as well, so I've got that kind of perspective, and it's never left me, albeit uh, that was quite some years ago. Uh, anyway, that is all we've got time for tonight. Thank you very much to my panel, Emma and Austin and Ben. Thank you. Uh, thank you as as well to you at home for your interaction tonight. Lots of emails still coming in. Lots of you uh, share my view uh, on prisons. Got to be said there. Lots of you do not as well. <laughs> anyway, keep your thoughts coming in. What do you want me to be focusing on in future shows? And as I mentioned at the start of the show, if there's anyone that you would like to see on the panel, you want to hear from them, uh, let me know. You can email me gbviews at gbnews.uk. You can tweet me as well at Michelle Jubes or at gbnews. Now you have yourself a fantastic fantastic evening. Uh, Nigel Farage is coming up in just a few minutes and I will see you same time tomorrow. Good evening. Alex Deacon here with your latest weather update from the Met Office. Another dry day for the vast majority tomorrow. Probably a bit sunnier for many of us and as a result feeling a little warmer as well. This area of high pressure has been controlling our weather for most of this week. There are signs of weather fronts getting closer for the weekend. More on that in a moment but for the time being uh, high pressure promising a dry night for the vast majority. Just the small chance of one or two showers over the Northern Isles and perhaps later in the night across the southeast of England. Certainly eastern parts of England keeping a fair bit of cloud, but for many we'll have largely clear skies. And again, it will be pretty fresh in the morning. Temperatures well down into single figures and in rural parts of Northern England, Northern Ireland, Southern Scotland, there will be a frost maybe as low as minus two or minus three. So yes, a cold start to Friday, but for quite a few of us, it will be a sunny start to what will be a fine spring day. Again, eastern England's most